All right. Well, on behalf of everyone at the Center for Brain Health, we would like to give you a welcome to our Frontiers of Brain Health series, where we take a deep dive into the most exciting new developments in brain research. Um, I'm Dr. Julie Frattentoni. I'm a neuroscientist and head of research integration here at Brain Health. Um, I do want to mention for those of you joining us virtually online that there will be a chance um, to ask questions at the end. So if you're thinking of questions, go ahead and drop those into the Q&A function. Um, and for those of you in person, um, jot down your questions as well, because there'll be time um, for you to ask those at the end. Um, this also will be recorded. So. For those of you who don't know much about us, the Center for Brain Health is a cognitive neuroscience research center at the University of Texas at Dallas. And we have dedicated the past three decades to exploring neuroplasticity and the brain's amazing lifelong potential to get stronger and work better. And so next I'm gonna introduce our speaker, Dr. Holly Bowen. She is, let me grab my correct note. Um, all right, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at SMU right here in Dallas. And her lab is called the Maple Lab, which I love. She's from Toronto. So um, it stands for Memory and Effective Processes Across the Lifespan. So her research focuses on how affective states, specifically things like emotion and motivation, influence how we form memories and remember past experiences. She's also interested in the links between, how the links between emotion, motivation, and memory are impacted by age-related cognitive changes. Um, and so she uses a variety of different methods like computational modeling, um, neuroimaging with event-related potentials, and fMRI. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Holly Bowen. Thank you everyone for coming today and to Julie for inviting me. Uh, I'm excited to share a line of work that I actually started some time ago as a graduate student. So when we think about aging, often what comes to mind is declines or memory problems. And I hope that the data that I present today might convince you that it's not all bad. Maybe this group is, in particular doesn't need that convincing. But it's not all bad, and there are some things that are preserved or maintained in healthy aging. And to me, that's kind of the exciting part of aging or studying aging is when things are going right. So motivation, by definition, leads to goal-directed behavior. You know this from your own experiences. So for example, Maybe you came here today because they were offering you some free lunch. But motivation also leads to goal-directed cognition. So if you have an interest in a subject matter, you typically have better memory uh, for that type of information that you have some intrinsic motivation for. What I'm going to be talking about today is extrinsic motivation. So the free lunch situation, or maybe you can relate to this person on the treadmill uh, chasing after the donut. And the question that my colleagues and I and other researchers have been asking is whether motivation can still modulate our cognition as we age. So can older adults flexibly, cognitively control their memory processes to remember things that are valuable if we give them some extrinsic motivation or incentive to do so? And there are a number of interesting reasons to ask this question. So first, even when pathology is not present, healthy aging is associated with neurocognitive changes. One of those changes is dopaminergic decline. So this picture is showing the loss of dopamine or dopaminergic activity uh, in aging. So this is uh, seen with a PET scan. So on the left is a healthy 25-year-old woman, and on the right is a healthy 70-year-old woman. And incentive processing is associated with activity in the dopaminergic midbrain. And if that's the case, then incentive processing should undergo age-related changes. But what I'm gonna show you today is some data that suggests that despite age-related changes in dopamine, activation of reward circuitry remains relatively preserved or maintained in healthy aging. One of the lab-based tasks that we use to examine activity in the reward network is this monetary incentive delay task. Uh, so this task and a similar one will feature prominently in this presentation, so I'll spend a few minutes kind of detailing uh, this task. 
So it's a simple reaction time task where the participant is asked to press a button when a star briefly appears on the screen. So the, star, the amount of time the star stays on the screen speeds up and slows down based on that own individual's reaction time, so they get a hit rate of about 66%. And they are put into a state of reward or loss anticipation on a trial by trial basis. So at the beginning of each trial, they get a cue telling them how much they can win in the case of reward or how much they can avoid losing in the case of a loss uh, if they hit that star on time. Then they get some feedback telling them how they did. So either they hit the star or missed the star and then the monetary feedback of that trial. Samantha so Larkin and colleagues uh, in 2007 were able to demonstrate that a reward region, shown here up in the right, the ventral striatum, remained sensitive to rewards in older adults. So as the amount of that reward that they could gain increased, so did the amount of activity in the ventral striatum for both younger and older adults similarly. As the amount of loss uh, increased, Younger adults, again, showed greater activation in this region, but older adults sort of show the same amount of activity. So older adults, this ventral striatum uh, region, uh, it, it was still sensitive to rewards for older adults, but showed kind of reduced sensitivity to losses. Now this is a region of interest analysis, so they were specifically looking in this one region uh, to look at how it varied based on their task conditions. But we know that complex cognition and complex cognitive processes are not localized to a single region of the brain. So we wanted to follow up and extend this work to examine what was going on in the rest of the brain as younger and older participants were doing this task, so particularly during reward anticipation. So we had people come to the scanner. We had 16 younger adults and 15 older adults, so young adults around 25 years old and older adults around 69 years old. We put them in the scanner as they did this reaction time task, and we had four task conditions. So they either saw a cue that said win or lose $5, so gain or loss anticipation, and then non-gain, non-loss anticipation, where they saw a cue that said win or lose $0, so sort of serving as a baseline condition. Looking at the reaction times to the star, here, Younger adults are in the white bars, older adults in the gray bars. So if you look at the $5 condition, so when they could win or lose $5, younger adults are faster on those trials than on the $0 trials. Older adults, their reaction time stays pretty consistent across the four different conditions. So to analyze what was going on in the brain during this task, we used partial least squares, or a PLS analysis. I'm not gonna get into the weeds uh, of this analysis, but happy to answer questions about it later. But just to give you a primer, PLS is a multivariate spatial temporal whole brain analysis. So PLS operates on the covariance between your experimental design and your brain voxels to give you orthogonal variables, or so-called latent variables, that optimally relate these two sets of measurements. So instead of giving the analysis software a particular contrast or a brain region that you are particularly interested in, you give it the timing of your experiment, you give it your brain voxels, and it pulls out the most significant patterns in the data. So first we're just gonna focus on what's going on in the brain during this reward anticipation phase across all the brain voxels. So focusing on this gain and lose of $5 or win and lose $0. So the analysis gave us two significant latent variables, so two different patterns in the data. The first pattern suggests an age-independent effective value, so valence and age-independent effective value. So you don't need to be concerned with the actual values on this graph, but rather just the pattern of the bars. So here you can see, again, younger adults are in white bars, older adults are in gray bars, and for those $5 trials, those bars are going in the same direction for both age groups. So for the $5 trials, they are positive, and for the $0 trials for both age groups, they are negative, and there's no difference in valence. 
So to show you the brain regions that are associated with this pattern, we get uh, the warm colors here are associated with processing those $5 cues, gain or loss. Both younger and older adults during that $5 anticipation engage the reward network, so regions like the midbrain, ventral striatum, insula, as well as various neocortical regions kind of throughout the brain. So to process these $5 cues, both younger and older adults are recruiting the same network of regions to the same extent. The second pattern was an age variant pattern. So here we are seeing some age differences. So this pattern involved an interaction of age and incentive magnitude. Again, no effective valence. So no difference between gain and loss. So again, here, if you look at the direction of the bars, now younger and older adults are pulling apart in different directions. So the brain pattern associated with this, when older adults are processing those $5 cues, in addition to recruiting that first network of regions, they are also recruiting some regions that you might associate with default mode network. So they're recruiting additional regions like bilateral posterior cortex, inferior parietal lobule, lateral temporal gyrus, posterior cingulate. And they're also recruiting regions that you might consider to be cognitive control regions, so lateral prefrontal cortex in particular. So older adults to process these $5 cues in this reaction time task are over recruiting default mode network and cognitive control regions in the service of these motivational goals. So in response to these incentive cues compared to younger adults who do not activate these regions. So again, no effective valence here. They're doing the same, showing the same activation patterns for when it was a gain or a loss. Next, we wanted to look at what's going on in the brain during reward and loss feedback. So after they hit the star, they get some feedback telling them if they hit it on time or not, and the monetary outcome of that trial. So here we focus just on those $5 trials, so when there was actual money at stake. Um, so we have four different types of feedback. So if they hit the star during a win condition, then they get the $5. Uh, if they hit the star, uh, sorry, if they don't hit the star, they get miss and they don't earn that $5. In the loss condition, if they hit the star on time, they avoid losing the $5, uh, but if they miss, they do lose the $5. So again, we did a PLS functional covariance analysis, but this time we used some seed regions. And we chose these seed regions a priori, so we focused on the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is thought to play a key role in coding for subjective value of reward and monitoring the outcome of your current choices. And the caudate region, I don't know if you can see the little yellow dot there, the caudate, uh, which has been, is part of the dorsal striatum and is implicated in reward processing in a lot of prior work. So by choosing some seed regions and putting those into the analysis, we are mildly constraining the analysis. So we're still looking for the strongest patterns in the data that includes these seed regions. So the functional covariance between these seed regions, the rest of the brain given our four task conditions. And what we find is a significant, one significant latent variable that accounts for most of the variance. And I'm calling it sort of a general feedback network. So this is a set of regions that both younger and older adults are recruiting. Doesn't matter if it's a gain or a loss, doesn't matter if it's a hit or a miss. There's a set of regions that both age groups are recruiting to the same extent to process that feedback. So this general feedback network includes some regions of the reward networks, so dorsal and ventral striatum, thalamus, cingulate, posterior and central gyrus, and middle and superior temporal gyrus. So these findings that older adults can and do engage the reward network in similar brain regions as younger adults to process these reward incentives. We next asked, can healthy older adults 
tap into this preserved ability uh, of preserved motivational processing to modulate declarative memory. So some prior work had been done. Uh, this is work from Alan Castell's lab at UCLA. They've shown in many, many papers now that older and younger adults remember words that are paired with a high point value better than a low point value. In these cases, points actually mean nothing. They just tell their participants, try to maximize your points, and they find that both older and younger adults can do that. Uh, work from Mara Mather's lab at USC. Participants in their study saw pictures of objects and monetary incentives were present in the trial, but they were actually incidental to memory performance. So what they found is that both younger and older adults memory performance benefited just from the presence of monetary rewards being present in the task, even though they weren't actually tied to memory. So we wanted to build on this work and extend these findings to recognition memory. For items that had been intentionally encoded uh, within the context of a high or low reward anticipation. So this is the monetary incentive encoding task. It looks very similar to that reaction time task I showed you previously. But here participants are shown images. We just used indoor and outdoor scenes that they intentionally encode for a memory test that they know will come later. So before each image, they get a cue telling them how much they can earn if they successfully remember that picture on the subsequent memory test. In this case, we used high value cues of $1 and low value cues of one cent. Uh, importantly, this is not in the scanner, so this is just participants coming to our lab and doing a behavioral task on the computer. They came back to the lab 24 hours later and did an old new recognition task. So they saw items that they had previously encoded the day before and items that were new that they never saw. So if they say old to something that they did previously study, they get a hit and they earn either the $1 or one cent that it had been paired with at encoding. However, if they commit a false alarm, meaning they say old to something that's actually new that they didn't see before, they lose 50 cents. And we put this false alarm penalty in place to curb liberal responding. So if we didn't have this penalty in place, they could just say old to everything, and then they get all the rewards, but we don't have any data. <laughs> so this false alarm penalty is in place just to prevent people from saying old to everything. So this is their recognition performance uh, 24 hours later. So this is uh, plotting on the y-axis is D prime. So this is taking into account both hits and false alarms. So in this figure, the high reward items are in green and the low reward items are in white. Younger adults on the left, older adults on the right. Uh, what you can see, older adults don't perform as well as younger adults sort of overall. So their bars are just overall lower. Uh, maybe that's not particularly surprising. But what's interesting is that they are showing reward sensitivity. They're showing the same pattern as younger adults. So both age groups have better memory for these high value items compared to the low value items. So they're remembering those images paired with $1 to a greater extent than one cent. So next we wanted to figure out what is the memory related process that is driving this effect. So we wanted to just replicate our effects from experiment one. So in another sample of younger and older adults, do we find the same pattern? But second, we wanted to test more directly whether reward anticipation is enhancing memory consolidation processes. So it's possible that there are sort of two competing things going on here. So it's possible that when participants are encoding these images, that they're just using preferential encoding. So when the high value images come up, maybe they focus a lot of attention on those images, they use some sort of encoding strategy, and when the low value images come up, they maybe inhibit those images, or they don't use an effective encoding strategy. And if that's the case, if they're just using preferential encoding, then we should see an enhancement in memory on both an immediate test of memory and a delayed test of memory. But if reward anticipation is actually driving consolidation processes, which are time dependent, 
So when you see that high value reward, it maybe signals to your brain, this is something important, this is something valuable. So when you go to sleep that night, your brain is, your hippocampus is replaying that for you, strengthening that memory trace to a greater extent for high value than low value. If that's the case, and these uh, consolidation processes are necessary to see this effect, then we should only see an effect on a delayed test of memory when these consolidation processes have had time to unfold. So we shouldn't see an effect on an immediate test of memory. So to test these two hypotheses about what's driving this effect, we did another experiment where we included a within subjects manipulation of retention interval. So half of the items were tested immediately after encoding, and half of the items are tested the next day when they come back to the lab. So looking at the delayed test of memory, our first uh, question was whether we could replicate our findings from the first experiment. And this is what I'm showing here. So after a 24-hour delay, we're, we're seeing in this second sample, both younger and older adults are remembering those high-value items to a greater extent than low-value items. On the immediate test of memory, we find no effective reward. So here, younger and older adults are not showing better memory for high over low value information. So this is some evidence that older adults are showing the same behavioral pattern as younger adults and are exhibiting reward modulated memory. But these behavioral results don't tell us kind of how older adults are doing this task and whether they're using the same brain regions or same neural mechanisms as younger adults to do this task. So to complement these findings, these behavioral findings, we turn to fMRI. So going back to the results that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, we found that during uh, processing of monetary rewards in that reward anticipation phase, both younger and older adults were recruiting regions of the reward network to the same extent. So that's what we're showing on the left, those same results that I showed you previously. But we also found that older adults were engaging some prefrontal regions to help them during the processing of those $5 cues. So we're seeing the engagement of these frontal regions, and this fits with a lot of findings in the cognitive aging literature that uh, with uh, older adults, they need a little bit of a boost or a little bit of uh, extra neural recruitment to help them in these complex cognitive tasks. Now, we found these neural patterns to monetary incentives, but this was not within the context of a memory paradigm. So this was just during that reaction time task, not when they were asked to encode any particular information. So there have only been two studies at, that, at the time that we did this experiment that had examined neural responses associated with reward modulated memory in older adults. And essentially, both of these studies found that when looking in an ROI, so a region of interest of the reward network, so this is an image of the ROI that was used in this Cohen et al. paper, that activity in this reward network did not correlate or support memory processing or successful memory in older adults. In other words, activation in this reward network did not predict successful memory for high value items for older adults. And this was kind of surprising because at the time there was actually quite a bit of evidence that in younger adults, activation in this reward network was tied to uh, kind of boosting declarative memory. So here, when younger adults recruit this, this network, we see that this boosts memory for high reward items. It's predictive of their successful encoding. So even though we've seen a few times now that younger and older adults can show the same pattern behaviorally, they seem to be doing something different neurally to support that behavior. So the question is, how does reward anticipation kind of boost declarative memory formation in healthy older adults? We suggested, based on these findings, we need to look outside of the reward network. So going back to these findings here, where we had activation of the reward network, but older adults also uh, recruiting these frontal regions, 
In this study, we examined functional connectivity between reward regions and the rest of the brain during reward anticipation of that memory task. And so based on these findings, that in addition to recruiting the reward network, older adults rely on these frontal regions to process monetary incentives, we hypothesized that uh, there would be greater connectivity between the reward network and frontal regions, and that this particular connectivity would support successful encoding of high value items or high value information for older adults, but not for younger adults. So we had participants do this monetary incentive encoding task, this time in the scanner. Again, they're just seeing indoor and outdoor scenes. They know that their memory for these scenes is going to be tested. At the beginning of each trial, they get a high or a low value queue. In this case, we used a high value queue of $5 and a low value queue of 10 cents. We also had them do that monetary incentive delay task while they were in the scanner so we could use it as a functional localizer. So a functional localizer involves the comparison of two or more conditions to isolate a functionally specialized region of the brain. So in this uh, study, we're using this MID task, particularly reward anticipation phase, to localize the reward network, and then using that uh, reward network as a region of interest when we're looking at the memory uh, data. So again, participants came back to the lab 24 hours later, outside the scanner, they do an old new recognition task. So again, if they successfully get a hit, they remember something they studied the day before, they earn either the $5 or 10 cents. It had been paired with add encoding. In this case, if they commit a false alarm, they lose $2.55. So just looking at the recognition performance, do we replicate what we found in those two studies outside the scanner? So overall, there was a main effect of reward. Here we're just looking at hit rate. Both younger and older adults remember the high value images on the left compared to the low value images on the right to a greater extent. But we actually find no interaction with age, no main effect of age. So our older participants are performing just as well as our younger participants on this task overall and showing the same pattern. Next, we wanted to look at memory-related activity in a region of interest that looking particularly at the reward network. So activation from that MID reaction time task during reward anticipation we used a contrast of high greater than low value across younger and older adults. And we get this pattern here. And we chose, if you can see my cursor here, this pink sphere here. Uh, we created a six millimeter sphere around that left caudate region to use as an ROI or a region of interest in our memory analyses. So we chose this particular region because it was the most significant cluster to come out um, of these data. So we wanted to look at what's going on in this cluster during reward anticipation uh, and subsequent memory. So here, this is the memory task. We have four conditions. So participants could have a high reward subsequent hit, uh, recognition hit, subsequent uh, recognition miss, or a low reward subsequent recognition hit or recognition miss. When we look at activity in this left caudate region, as a function of our four task conditions, we find that actually activity in this region does predict successful memory encoding for high value items for both younger and older adults and doesn't predict performance for any other condition. So this is in contrast to those two studies that had been previously published where they looked in that region of the uh, region of interest of the reward network, didn't find that it predicted successful memory encoding for older adults. Here we're finding at least activity in this left caudate seed that we found using that functional localizer does predict successful uh, encoding of high value information. But we were really interested in this question, this hypothesis of connectivity between the reward network and frontal regions. So we used that caudate seed as a seed region 
and did a functional connectivity analysis with the rest of the brain, given our four task conditions. And what we find is that that left caudate region does uh, connect uh, functionally, uh, greater functional connectivity between that left caudate region and left and right inferior frontal gyrus, and that this was tied to successful encoding of high reward stimuli for older adults, but not younger adults. So both younger and older adults are using this caudate region in the reward network to help boost declarative memory. Additionally, older adults are relying on functional connectivity between this reward network and these two regions of the frontal lobe uh, to, to support their successful encoding. Younger adults are not. So frontal striatal functional connectivity supports reward enhanced memory in older adults, but not necessary for younger adults. So to kind of sum up what I've talked about today, motivational signaling in the reward network is relatively intact in older age. So older and younger adults are using the same network of regions during reward anticipation, during feedback processing. Uh, they're using that same network to the same extent. Older adults are still sensitive to rewards and motivational incentives and can use incentives to improve performance on memory tasks. So they're able to flexibly allocate their processing resources to compensate in, in areas where we typically see age-related changes or age-related decline. So for cognitive losses or deficiencies, they can use these resources in the service of these motivational goals. But older adults, in addition to recruiting the same network as younger adults to perform these co uh, complex cognitive tasks, they seem to recruit additional prefrontal regions to support this processing, both processing in that reaction time task, but also to support processing uh, in, um, in successful encoding of those high value items. So I am not a translational researcher. I'm a, you know, kind of a basic scientist, but as our population is aging and we're looking for ways to maintain cognitive function, you know, maybe there are some ways that we can use this information to create cognitive interventions or even pharmacological interventions, since we're kind of tapping into that dopaminergic midbrain here to prolong independence. So with that, I will thank funding uh, resources, people who helped out uh, with these, collecting these data. That's a QR code to my lab website where you can find all of the full text published papers in addition to some new um, papers that are coming out in this line of work that I didn't have a chance to talk about today. Um, and I'll sort of leave these conclusion points up here. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Holly, that was fantastic. Um, we will go ahead and open it up to questions in our live audience as well as online. So feel free to raise a hand and we'll bring you a microphone. I will kick us off. I did have a question and if this takes us too off topic, um, you know, this was very like extrinsic motivation in terms of a monetary incentive. Um, what do you know about the literature in terms of kind of more intrinsic motivation? I know that's hard, harder to pin down and study. Yeah, so a lot of labs, not so much in aging, but just uh, looking at younger adults have been using curiosity as a way to sort of measure intrinsic motivation. So when they come into the lab, participants are given like trivia questions and they're probed about how interested they are in finding out the answer if they don't know the answer, um, sort of using that as a way to sort of gauge their intrinsic motivation. Um, but what is typically found is that you, whether it's extrinsic motivation or intrinsic motivation, or you're using points or you're using money, you're activating the same kind of network of regions in the reward network. So I expect that in, in older adults, we would see something similar with curiosity. Yeah, that's great. I have another question that I'll ask. <laughs> um, when it comes to, you know, memory is something we all care about, we all want to preserve our memory as we age, and I know you're not in the translational space, but just what are things based on your research that you kind of do in your day-to-day -day life? You know, it's like, do you assign higher, higher values in your head to things that you want to remember? I wouldn't say that I use this personally. Um, 
to, to remember information. There is some work coming out of Allison Adcock's lab at Duke, and I don't know the details of this, but they're trying to increase activation in the reward network using something like a biofeedback mechanism where they, participants can kind of see how much activation there is and they're able to like ramp it up <laughs> themselves. And then they're looking at sort of cognitive performance after that. So maybe that's sort of an avenue. Um, maybe I do that unconsciously. <laughs> Okay, we have an online question. Here, Julie, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So um, what would be your hope for like the next step in translational research? Like, it seems to me the, the hope would be you find a way, because we're all about finding precision brain health. What helps a particular person improve not only their overall brain health, but maybe where they're a little bit do you have any groups there looking at kind of like what this, how to test whether you're actually improving memory uh, by amplifying this part of the brain? So I don't have any work looking at individual differences. I don't really have the sample sizes to do that type of analysis. Um, what sort of comes to mind is in pharmacological research, for someone, for example, who has Parkinson's disease and is maybe showing some cognitive um, changes as a result of that, one helpful thing is when they start taking L-DOPA or something that is in increasing dopamine in the brain, they start to see um, some of these cognitive changes, maybe some, uh, an improvement in some of these cognitive changes. So that's a possibility. Um, whether we can extend that to a healthy population or, or if we would want to extend that type of pharmacological intervention to a healthy population is another question. Um, but certainly, you know, increasing the amount of dopamine that we know is declining in older age may be one way to do that. Okay, this was a similar question from online was just, um, you know, what those potential interventions might be. So you addressed it. Um, I'm curious with, you know, kind of these additional prefrontal regions that older adults are recruiting, and I don't, I know it's not fun to speculate, I guess, but I'm just curious your thoughts on what that means in terms of just, you know, we know that there's greater, it's like cognitive effort and load and that like fatigues the system. And so just what are sort of these other implications of kind of these, um, what's the word, not like coping strategies, but the, the ways that older adults are modifying and able to kind of get the same performance. Um, yeah, just if you want to talk about it. Yeah, so in a lot of this work, you'll see in complex you know, mental tasks that older adults are recruiting these additional regions, particularly frontal lobe, that younger adults don't seem to need. Um, and so, as a result, their cognitive resources to do anything else are already kind of taxed. Um, and so you find that when you have them do maybe a divided attention task where they're trying to actually do two things, um, this becomes much more difficult with age because you're already using those resources to do something else. Um, so here, um, I guess sort of another part of your question when they're using those additional resources, they're able to get their performance up to the level um, of, an, of a younger adult, or at least show the same type of pattern. Um, so it is helpful in that sense. Um, I was gonna say something else, but now I forget. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too much, <laughs> too, too cognitively taxing. Yeah, we have another question over here, Sandy. Yeah, yeah, so really interesting and very thoughtful the way you manipulated all the areas. Uh, what am I? earlier doctoral students did her dissertation on decision making uh, and looking at uh, high versus low risk and she did it across the lifespan and she she didn't find an age effect but she did find that the task that you used selective learning predicted who would do well on this task, who would not respond in this logical decision making. So, and they used the task that Castell uh, developed, mm -hmm. you know, which was interesting. So it was a frontal lobe test that predicted who would be sensitive to wins and losses. So my question to you is, do you feel like maybe your aging group may have had cognitive cognitive problems did you screen uh, to make sure? Because that was something that we found really was important. So it wasn't an age effect, but, or, you know, 
it was really more related to some cognitive executive function that made them kind of uh, lose the decision making part. Yeah, so I would say this group is probably the opposite, <laughs> that we probably have very high functioning. Uh, we screened out for a lot of different um, factors. We had them do the MMSE. They're all scoring you know, almost perfectly on that, um, so a mini mental state exam. So I would say, especially in the MRI sample where you have to screen for so many other things, um, that that sample we didn't see an overall age effect in our memory performance, and that's likely because these are very high functioning, um, probably not representative uh, older adults in our sample. Um, but one thing, uh, so, we, so we haven't actually tested any type of executive functioning skills or anything to correlate with their performance on this task. Yeah. I was thinking about Ali's work as well and the framing of it. And so like as a gain compared to a loss, and I was kind of surprised that it was actually equal. Was that surprising to you or is that something you see a lot? Yeah, ex it was surprising, um, particularly because the prior work had suggested that there is some difference between gain and loss. Um, part of that could just be different, slightly different task conditions in some cases. Um, here, yeah, we, we have yet to find a, a valence effect in our work here. Um, but, you know, sort of socio-emotional selectivity theory might suggest that older adults should be better at rewards and maybe sort of ignore those losses or um, not be as sensitive to the losses, maybe, um, the, the loss feedback, yeah. Interesting, okay, we have a question right here. Yeah, about the finding that, you, the effect you found that wasn't found previously in other studies, do you have an idea about why that might be and do you think it has to do with the functional localizer or, or what's your kind of hypothesis on that? Yeah, um, so both of those tasks in the other two studies were using points. Um, and so it's possible that even though points do seem to activate the same reward region, maybe just not to the same extent, um, so one was from Alan Castell's lab where they used these points, um, which is the example that I showed. And so it's, you know, it's possible this is just a difference in the task condition, so points versus money, but also stimuli. So in the Castell work, they're using words a lot, and so they're actually seeing that kind of left frontal lobe is what is predicting um, better performance on that task. Uh, it's also a recall task, which is, you know, in some ways a harder task to do than a recognition task with images, which we're doing here. Um, so maybe just when the task becomes more difficult, the reward network isn't the thing that predicts performance. Um, but I think there's still a lot of room there to figure out what is going on. Yeah. We have another online question. Um, and so this person is wondering how much of this can be tied to neuroplasticity. Um, and I'm gonna add that we know that um, neuroplasticity exists well into old age, but we see depending on how you use your brain every day, that can change. Um, and so if yes, if this is tied to neuroplasticity, um, how can it be supported or encouraged? And then they put like, for example, doing things with your left hand if you're right-handed or <laughs> what are ways that neuroplasticity may um, interact with these different processes? I mean, so one possibility is that these older adults who are able to recruit these frontal regions are showing some sort of neuroplasticity where they're able to reallocate you know, processing regions to other areas of the brain that in younger adults they don't need to use um, in order to you know, be successful at this task and show similar patterns. Um, so you could think about it sort of that way that as if the brain is still plastic, they're able to kind of shift you know, where that activation is in the brain and kind of change that to um, boost their performance on these tasks. Uh, um, I noticed that you had a pretty large age separation between the young age and the older age. Have you been able to identify kind of the age range where the recruitment mm. of the prefrontal cortex starts to kind of occur or if that varies a whole lot between people or if it's pretty generalizable? Yeah, good question. Um, so I haven't done any studies, and I don't know of any studies off the top of my head that have taken a lifespan approach and included that sort of middle age sample to really answer that question. Um, there's 
probably other work outside of you know sort of reward um, and memory, but just in cognitive processing more generally in cognitive aging, we often see the recruitment of these um, frontal regions to kind of support behavior. When that actually occurs, probably going back to maybe Sandy's question about maybe when you start to see declines in executive function, um, things like that, then you might start to see that they're recruiting these additional networks to help to help boost that. But when exactly that happens is probably hard to pinpoint exactly. Yeah. Hi, Holly. Uh, I just want to, uh, this is sort of following up on the previous question. Uh, so if you made the task somehow more difficult for younger adults, would you expect to see that additional recruitment? Is that something you thought about? Y yeah, you probably um, would see some additional recruitment, whether it's in the frontal lobe or not, um, I'm unsure. So some of my behavioral work that we've been doing more recently in the lab has been trying to pinpoint the role of cognitive control in this type of task. And basically what we've been finding is that reward in this task does not seem to be boosting cognitive control. It seems to be more of an automatic kind of process that is happening that is supporting You're saying the memory. reward is more of an automatic? Yeah, so the reward activation um, and the boost in memory that you see seems to be more automatic than it is strategic. Um, Alan Castell's lab would say something totally different than that, <laughs> but that's using a very different task. So in the case of increasing the cognitive load, uh, for younger adults, you may see frontal regions be engaged, but you may see also see some more posterior regions. Um, so sometimes you see an anterior to posterior shift as you age. So younger adults recruit actually more uh, brain power from, you know, sort of occipital lobe, whereas older adults are recruiting actually more frontal lobe. Or you might see some hemisphere differences where maybe younger adults need to recruit like the left. Uh, prefrontal cortex, but not the right, and older adults need both, or something like that. Yeah, so, so did you see any uh, relationships, so you know, people who did, recruited more of this frontal, did they show better performance? Were you able to look at it? Um, that sort of area? I haven't looked at like individual differences because we don't have the power, right. yeah, the well, sample just, size. Maybe you could just, you know, I mean, without statistically testing, just look yeah, at I mean, I, Yeah, I could look at that, yes. <laughs> awesome. Any more questions? One, one over here, maybe. Oh, Samantha, did you have one? Go ahead. Yeah. Who won, or what was the most amount of money won? And could you like describe who, like, like I know that you can't give the identity, but just wh what type of person won the most? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so younger adults get the most. Um, I'm trying to see. I do have a slide. I don't know if I can. Oh, that's awesome. Here we go. Okay, so memory earnings. This is from the MRI task where they're doing the memory encoding and it's $5 cues and 10 cent cues. So this is the uh, average earnings of the younger adults and this is the average earnings of the older adults. Um, they did get to keep this money in addition to being paid to come to the MRI session. And so it was pretty lucrative <laughs> for them to, to come. Um, I wouldn't suggest using $5 because you can get the same effects using $1. <laughs> so, so how do you sign up to participate in your study? Yeah. <laughs> Julie Vlad's got a question. This is kind of off of Samantha's question. Especially dealing with such a wide age gap, would the relationship to the reward be different, especially like dealing with money? Meaning like the what, subjective what value yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of the money? Yeah, so that's kind of a, mm. not something I've investigated empirically, but just anecdotally, when the, the older adults come into the lab, of course the younger adults are coming in for the money, basically. But when the older adults come in, they, they're always like, oh, I'm not coming for the money. I just, you know, I like to come and, and I like to participate in these things. But then their brain is telling me they do care about the money because <laughs> they are responding in a similar way to the younger adults. They're not able to, I think, kind of flexibly change their reaction times in the same way, but I think that's because they're really trying on every trial and that's just as fast as they can get. Um, but then their brain is suggesting that they do care <laughs> at least a little bit about the money, yeah. So, in, in, so for us older folks, so we are earning more than $65, <laughs> Is there 
is there a reason to be now exploring maybe a difference in the older population, like based on their career or looking back at, are they long retired? Are they still working? Are they still activating those portions of the brain just based on what they're doing? Have you thought of going in that direction? Yeah, I haven't ever actually asked about socioeconomic status or household income or anything like that. Um, because we're seeing these effects in a sample that I would say are you know, comfortably, comfortably retired, high education levels. Um, some of them are still working, but generally not their, um, their career that they've had their whole life. They're doing something else now. Um, but that is a, a point to, especially because during the pandemic, we kind of started doing these um, experiments online on Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific. Um, where the samples may be doing something different, but they're very motivated by money. Otherwise, they would not be you know, sitting around on Amazon Mechanical Turk doing these studies. Um, but we're finding the same patterns, uh, at least behaviorally. What do you attribute the, the difference in the vocabulary between the younger folks and the older folks? That is actually very typical, um, that we see higher or better vocabulary abilities in older adults. Um, that is something that, <laughs> yeah, that uh, typically does not decline with age, at least in healthy aging. We don't see declines in um, semantic knowledge or vocabulary. That's something that seems to be resistant to forgetting. Um, and older adults just have a you know, longer uh, history of learning new words. Um, so they typically actually do show uh, better, better vocabulary skills than if you have an undergrad sample or something. Awesome. Oh, we have one, another question online. Okay. Have you considered what the implications are for an aging person with ADHD um, already impaired in dopamine and executive function for best late life performance and outcomes? For the, sorry, I missed the last part. Oh, um, so if they're already impaired in dopamine and executive function, ADHD, um, they're wanting to know in order to get like the best late life performance and outcomes. So for this type of task, I have in the past excluded people who report that they have ADHD or dyslexia or any other types of like executive function problems. So I can't answer that directly, but we're seeing at least in the older adults who we know have lower levels of dopamine that I showed at the beginning, that they're still able to at least recruit what what is what they have, um, and so that maybe that's enough on this type of task to see the same type of pattern as someone who uh, has a younger brain with with lots of dopamine floating around. Um, in terms of executive function, again, I haven't really examined the, the link between executive function skills or abilities and uh, abilities on this task. But I imagine if someone is easily distracted that they might not be um, have the same level of performance as someone who um, does not have ADHD overall. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, do we have any other questions? Thank you for asking such great questions and great, great answers, Holly. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I do want to just end on the note that lifelong brain health is our shared mission here at the Center for Brain Health. And we just really want to thank Dr. Holly Bowen again. Just one more round of applause for her. <laughs> This is our last Frontiers for 2023, and so we look forward to seeing you back in January 2024 for another great season. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Great job. Thanks.